a less exciting guy is coming into the frame. <laughs> um, yeah, Let's, uh, you can slide over. Woo! <laughs> Internet, thank you for joining us on, uh, what is this, Monday? Uh, yeah. It's Monday, right? We don't normally do, do, do we shred on Monday? I guess we do when, when you're in this line of work, right? Sure. <laughs> um, obviously, we are here with the uh, amazing Temu Montisari, who has decided to uh, grace the Western Hemisphere, or this section of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's spherical <laughs> with his presence uh, as uh, the the, uh, la the most recent leg of your of your tour wrapped up. Right, right. And... You played. New, you're, you're here in New York because you actually played a show. I went to the show. I don't know if anyone else has gone to a Winter Sun show, but I will tell you if you have not, you are missing out. Um, I don't know if, if it's possible to say that, or I don't know if it's if it's correct to say that uh, that I, you were smiling the entire time at a metal show. But this was, I think, totally representative of the Winter Sun vibe. I don't know if that's if you see it that way as well. Um. Yeah. Yeah. We try to have fun on stage, and uh, I think we have really good vibe uh, within the band members, and uh, we try to play little tricks on, on each other, like uh, te teasing each other on stage, and uh, that, that just makes it more fun, and also interact with the audience. So it's it's nice to see when people are having a good time, and then, of course, you know you don't want to have a crumby face all the time uh, <laughs> yourself either. So, Well, Yari, uh, it's funny because like you would think that uh, metal voice would be intimidating and scary, but somehow I feel like he's the host of a metal children's television show. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> you had the, what's the song about summertime? Um, the forest that weeps. The forest that weeps, but he's like, "Are you ready for summer?" <laughs> and yeah, like, and it's got this party, <laughs> party part, uh, the, yeah. the progressive thing in the middle that starts with the clean thing and then builds up, and then uh, the guys are dancing in the background. Uh, <laughs> I try to concentrate on my, on my playing on on the front. Is that the thing that I filmed where you had the uh, blue light behind you, or is that something else? Uh, it's a clean tone arpeggio type thing. Uh, that didn't probably have a blue light. Uh, let me see what has blue light. Uh, Winter Madness has blue. Battle Against Time yeah. has blue. Oh, my, my mic is off, isn't it? Because I didn't turn it off. Damn. Did you, maybe, you might have heard me through Temu's mic. I do this yeah, all the time. I left it on mute. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I do this constantly. Um, yeah, no, the, first of all, the, the show, like just the values of the show, right? I mean, it's not only is it high energy and it's fun, but you guys have, the, the trade, the, just the music itself is technically sophisticated. You're all trading parts. And then you've got the synchronized lights. And that's, I guess that's improv, sort of, or it's um, programmed? How does that even work? Um, it's partly programmed that there's certain settings that you then just cue at a certain point. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not like uh, time codes synchronized. Right. We, we do have that in, in Europe, where we have our own light desk. But for this tour, we didn't bring our, our regular light guy or the light desk. Uh, we had another. Uh, another person doing lights for this tour and w still worked great. Um, she had her own uh, own uh, system and basically just uh, work out, worked out the songs before the tour and then uh, made like uh, whatever settings she needed. And then uh, we had a little uh, little light r light rig that we brought with us, mm -hmm. but mostly uh, using the the venue lights. So that w it was like she knew what what things to queue up at different parts of different tunes, but she's running it all manually, essentially. Yes, exactly. So it's kind of like light improv. Yeah, she, she has light licks. and <laughs> yeah, yeah, and definitely it, it changes from night to night because of the venue lights. Sometimes you get really crappy venue lights, and then you have to you know, uh, maybe do different kinds of decisions. And, and the, the, I think what we had, we had maybe uh, six or eight moving heads, and then we had our own hazers and, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe some spots, but pretty, pretty uh, compact setup. Right. So each venue you get to, there's a slightly different rig present. Exactly. And how do you even know how to interface with that? They have their own light panel or something that you control? Yeah, then, then uh, yeah. I don't know so much, so much about the lights, but um, the, the light designer has to then uh, communicate with the local light, light guy to okay. you know, patch up everything the, the way that they want. Right. See, I have, this is the thing that, um, that I always think about is like, it would be really fun to be in a band that's e where the, everything is easy. Like, what's my fantasy is like, you're in a rock band, and the music is cool and interesting, but it's not technically demanding at all. And I call it the easy rock daydream. And like, Winter Sun is the opposite of easy rock, because all the parts are, you know, uh, disastrously hard. <laughs> and the show is complicated. And you bring all this gear, and it's all digital and complicated and, uh, you know, sophisticated. You had that, uh, you were showing me the rack yeah. um, that you use, and it's a remarkably compact for what it is. 
And so basically everything runs into what is essentially a stage box, which then goes to, uh, to the front of house. Yeah, um, so we have a couple different setups. We have a touring setup, which basically everything goes into this one big rack box tour mm -hmm. that you saw. And then, then uh, for flying dates, we take it apart into smaller carry-on luggage size uh, boxes and then uh, don't have to pay that much. Uh, or, or sometimes if we, uh, um, like uh, for a longer European tour, we would then uh, put everything in the box already and ship the box, but then we have to do it well beforehand. And then sometimes that's tricky with the rehearsals because you want to rehearse right before the tour. With the same gear? With the same gear. To know that it Un works. Unless you have like a double setup like like bigger bands. Uh, yes. Uh, that's really, that's got to be where a lot of the expense comes in, right? Because it's one thing to have a perfectly tuned up guitar that you like, and it's another thing to have five of them. Like one for each song that's got the, you know, weird alternate tunings and stuff, right? Sure, sure. So, and what are you playing through on this? Um, so on, on this tour, yeah. uh, it's the uh, still XFX Ultra, so the first version of XFX, because we used so much time dialing in the, the, the sound that we wanted on that version. We, uh, we tried the XFX 2, kind of trying to take that sound and put it on XFX 2, but we uh, didn't succeed with that so well, so we sticked with the, uh, uh, XFX 1. And now those units are almost 10 years old, so they are starting to fall apart. So we had to repair them a couple of times, and now they are running out of the replacement parts. For so the original units? For the original ones. So I think we have to switch to XFX3, which is out now. Right. And, and the issue wasn't that the units sounded different, or was just translating the patches or something? Yeah, you cannot transfer the, because it's different modeling te technology in each, each uh, XFX1, XFX2, XFX3. So you cannot take the same preset and just nicely transfer it to the next unit. But, right. uh, but you have to kind of build it from ground up. And the one problem was also that uh, the that one amp modeling uh, that amp model that we use on XFX one that doesn't exist on XFX two, <laughs> right? <laughs> yet, yet people, this still works <laughs> from nineteen eighty two or whatever this was. Yeah, right. I mean, it's amazing. I have cassettes that still work. We have a stack of VHS tapes out there that still work. Yeah, and the tape hasn't melted or rotted or whatever happens to tapes yeah. after you know thirty years. Yeah. but uh, it's funny. There's like vintage digital now, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was just telling you how. Nice. It feels after this uh, one month of, of playing just Axe Effects and uh, and plug in uh, for my lessons to to play through a real amp like like this one here. Right. And what and why would that matter though? Or you were saying there was like a latency uh, issue potential. Yeah. It's it's a very different feel. Um, I like the dynamics more and the the the, the response that you get from a real amp. But um, yeah, it's very very different uh, different feel and when you get used to the Axe Effects where it's so immediate, uh, it's in-ear monitoring, so it's right there. There's, uh, there's still a little bit of latency because of the wireless stuff. You have wireless uh, guitar, um, guitar stuff, and then wireless in-ear monitor stuff as well. And then XFX probably adds one or two milliseconds as well. So, so, so you're going over the air both, wa both ways, exactly. from the guitar to the rig, right. and then from the rig back to your head. Exactly. Right. And uh, and you can hear that. Um, I think you can feel that. Um, with certain things, um, when you do faster picking stuff, then then you kind of get used to it after a while. But if you don't play the Axe Effects for a while and you play real amp back home, mm -hmm. then it's a very different feel. To be fair to Axe Effects, though, like it's not, um, and, and I have no dog in this fight. I just I say this because I know these things are political. Right? <laughs> like it's it's if you plug directly into that thing, you probably don't notice it, right? Um, as much. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, the thing is that XFX1 doesn't even have headphone output, so oh, okay. XFX2 does. So. It does. Wait, they, they forgot the headphones. <laughs> now look, I, I know the people that do hardware, because I've done a little bit of software, but I've never done the hardware, which is like the bionics aspect yep. of how does the programming link to the machine, and that stuff is like voodoo to me. So people that can hack a box together, like a physical thing to do something, even when it comes to analog stuff like, like, power, like uh, guitar amps with tubes and stuff, yeah. That's a skill like, you know, when I get old and retired and I get more gray, <laughs> not gray, but more gray, <laughs> like I will get my overalls and my, you know, my whiskey and then I'll build amps or something yeah, cool yeah. like that. But uh, th th yeah, I, I totally get what um, you're saying about the physical feel and obviously we have the, the, the amp here. Yeah. I just kind of like when it, it's weird, but I like when it's yelling at me from the corner, like very directional and it's coming from here and I can hear it over there because yes. that's what I'm used to. Yeah, you know? for, for me, uh, when I was playing here, uh, in the beginning, it sounded like it's very dark, but but uh, but the people here, it's it's the amp simulation, oh. which is not the same. But then, 
when somebody opened the door here and I, I was getting the, the reflection from the door, that sounded more like the sound that I That's actually right. hear because then it's more direct into my ear. Well, right. So when you're listening to your axe patches, those are basically simulated mic'd up amp patches, right? It's uh, not yes. the sound of the speaker in the room. Exactly. It's the sound of the speaker coming through studio monitors, right? Yes, exactly. And that's so, a huge difference. That's true. You know, it, nothing wrong with it, but yeah. you know, when I was a kid, that's the sound I wanted. Like right. I wanted to be able to sound like Van Halen's sure. coming from the stereo, yeah. but Van Halen out of the amp probably sounds, you know, completely different. Right, than... but that's the thing in our in ears. We have so big mix of of these tracks, the backing tracks and, and drums and bass and everything. You want to hear your own backing vocals. So the more, uh, uh, the the more direct and more tighter the sound is, instead of like big yep. big room sound, yes. then then you can make more. Uh, more clear in ear mix for yourself. Right now, do you feel like what you're hearing has an well, it has to, right? But do you, do you feel like there's an effect on what you're playing? For sure. For, and is it a good or a bad thing, or is it just something you get used to? Uh, trying to get used to. Uh, it's always a little bit of a struggle with in ears. It's hard to find a totally perfect mix, and hard to find in ears that don't uh, that don't have any uh, leaking. Um, oh, okay. Because they're um, also your ear protection, right? Uh, right, exactly. So so kind of finding that balance where you hear some of the stuff from stage. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't have drums actually in my in-ear mix, but we're still so close to the drums that I hear them from, from, from my back. I have a little bit of triggers there, so I hear the, the kick drums with the triggers. Uh, uh -huh. but, but everything else comes uh, uh, through the through the isolation. And how loud is the stage volume without those things? Can you be up there or is it um, prohibited? Um, I wouldn't be there wouldn't next be. to the cymbals. <laughs> uh, we, all yeah. the drummers that we've played with, Winters and uh, they are all pretty hard hitting uh, And, and deaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, loudest show I ever went to was Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. And it was so loud. Like I didn't have any kind of ear protection for that yeah. yet. Uh, I now have actually um, West Tone molded um, yeah. musicians' earplugs, yeah. the ones that have the hole in the middle that allow in yeah. some of the treble. Those are great. Yeah, I really like those because it, at least it sort of sounds like you're at a concert exactly. and not like with a pillow over your head. Right. You know. So, so that's what we use as well, kind of uh, molded to your own ear. Right. Uh, I use Sensophonics, which is one of the one of the few brands that actually do that soft silicon that actually oh. you know. Okay. Uh, when you're opening your jaw, it's actually, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it stays it's, in. Yeah, it stays okay. in. So instead of like mo most companies, they do this hard plastic mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, that's minor or more like you kind of work them in there. And right, right. I feel like uh, it's plugged into my brain. Yeah, so the Sensophonics are, are definitely uh, the best that I've tried. I've tried many different ones uh, before as well, but, but they they work really well, but, uh, but still uh, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes you get some leaking. Maybe, you, you know, uh, your, your ear, uh, uh, maybe gets a little bit smaller or bigger depending on if you lose weight or if you gain weight as oh, well really? and stuff like that. So, so, so it's sometimes really hard to find that perfect fit, and and sometimes it's uh, it's really it can be a minor detail, but but you know if you have a perfect isolation, then you don't have to worry even a second about that during a show. Right. And some stages they have like. Uh, a lot of bleed from the PA comes actually back to the stage, and then it's kind of really hard to to hear in your ear in ears what's going on. Then right. you have to boost it a lot, and then that's not nice either. And like you never use monitor wedges anymore, right? It, that's, uh, no, because it's all just PA going out, exactly. which has to make things a little easier. Right. So right. basically, on stage, it's just the drums that you hear there, yeah. and, and uh, then everybody has in ears, and then uh, the PA goes to the audience. And the drummer is uh, is that triggers that that setup, or is it? Are there mics on that on your uh, kit? Mics on the kit. Uh, everything is mic'd, and then the kick drums are mic'd plus triggers. Plus triggers. Because uh, I thought the drum sound actually was amazing. Like cool. I heard actual snares. I'm not used to hearing real snares. Yeah. Especially in metal, where it sounds like a guy's beating a plank of wood. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I heard, <laughs> psh, you know, and I love that sound. Yeah. Like the yeah. real. There's a, a really cool moment at the end of, um, I think it's Top Jimmy on. I know I'm dating myself, but it's like the Van Halen record, and at the very end of the song, you can hear the, the guitar feeding back, and you hear. Psh, yeah because the snare was clearly like Alex was in the same room. Uh, right, you could hear right. that, and I love that sound to, to an you know, extent. Sure. But uh, I think your drummer probably, um, number of notes per dollars earned is definitely <laughs> the worst ratio of anyone on stage. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, it's nonstop, like the whole show. It's just, it's just going and going and going. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know how. Yeah, the, those guys are all all crazy. We've now played with Winter Zone with uh, four different drummers mm -hmm. because the original drummer 
guy has been playing with Nightwish now for, for a while, so we've had these uh, fill-in guys, uh, three different guys, and, uh, and uh, they've all been doing a great job. Who was it last night? Uh, it's uh, Heikki Saari, who okay. plays uh, uh, usually with Fintroll, uh, and he's got another band called Horion. Uh, he used to play Norther with Jukka back in the day, so that's how we uh, knew him before. Okay. Yeah, I mean, all, every, everyone in your band is a ringer, first of all. Amazing players. And uh, specifically with respect to guitar, I think that you probably, and I, all kidding aside, I think you're probably the highest average ratio of guitar skills of any band that I can think of. Because, you know, you might have two, but nobody's got three, like, incredible players, and, and Yari doesn't have to play anymore. And, you know, you're still... Um, recreating some of the incredible stuff that he laid down however many years ago, like over 10 years ago. Right? Yeah, yeah. How did you, and actually somebody here I think asked a question. It says, uh, how did you figure out all the solos that Yari used to play live? Did you sit down with him and go through every lick or did you just figure out everything yourself by ear? Um, some of the stuff I had been playing some bits and pieces before, mm -hmm. uh, before I, uh, I got promoted to the uh, <laughs> solo guitar role in the band. Um, when uh, when we had the discussion and, and Yari said that he'd rather uh, start focusing just on vocals and, and then I would do the solos and then we would look for another guitar player, that's when I kind of started looking more seriously into them. And I had the, um, the tracks obviously already before uh, and then I pretty much just started transcribing them on my own. Um, so you had the actual original the masters yes sort of. for for the um, at that time it was just the, the, um, the time time one and I think uh, I had some some of the forest seasons tracks as well but from the first album I still didn't have the the isolated ones uh, so I was just figuring so them just out from from live versions we had recorded some live shows before and and I was checking like uh, what kind of version you did live and compared that to the original album version and we had some old like rehearsal versions as well recorded and then I compared them as well from 2004 wow. to, to the latest ones and, and saw what changed and, and I realized some parts Yari improvised and some parts he might have uh, forgotten and relearned different way and, and uh, then I uh, kind of had to choose between a few different versions of how to do things and, and sometimes I would maybe use a little bit different picking that that I knew that he would use uh, but uh, usually I would just try to go uh, as close to the original sound uh, usually as close to the album sound as possible right because the fans probably want to hear the one they know or I assume they uh, yeah. we all assume that that whatever was played w is the gospel and that's the way it was intended to be played yeah even if there was a mistake in there we don't know right? and, and uh, yeah uh, there's always some some little things and and uh, but yeah, in this kind of music, it's so uh, thoroughly composed that uh, there's not so much space for improv. What right. you what you can improvise is is of course the the phrasing, how you deliver the notes, whether you go with slide or hammer on and stuff like that. But you don't start changing notes, or or well, sometimes you do, but it's not intentional. Yeah. You don't want to get demoted because <laughs> I mean, just were promoted. So, right. <laughs> was he very particular about how you adapted these, or uh, no, not really. Um, some stuff uh, I would ask him to do a, a video where I wasn't sure like oh, what, really? what the hell he was doing. Um, and then I would check from there uh, for, for fingering in particular because he, he's got uh, about this much longer fingers <laughs> than me. So, so some, some things that are natural for him didn't maybe make sense for me originally. But then when I see him doing it, then, uh, yeah, then usually I would try to do it with the same fingering also tone-wise because then you, know, you get the same same uh, tone on the same strings uh, but uh, and he um, as far as the right hand I and mean, obviously you don't get the sense listening to any of these especially something like winter madness right yeah. that there was any consideration as to whether it should be easy or hard it's just like I want that scale and I want that arpeggio and I don't I'm just gonna play that right it's like willpower but now uh, obviously being a teacher and having a somewhat of an analytical understanding yeah. of what you do, do also do you he didn't do you think he he was thinking about that stuff like you know was there any technical consideration of what was hard or easy or how was he planning out some of these lines when he wrote them probably not much um i i think yari uh approaches solo writing also from from very uh kind of uh 
compositional point of view instead of impro improvising. Uh, right. So so he really figures out what fits this chord and then you know what kind of arpeggio and how to connect these notes here and, and stuff like that. Um, but not so much thinking. Well, maybe I shouldn't write that line because of whatever layout of the instrument or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, I don't want to uh, put words into his mouth. Yeah. I'm not, not yeah. quite sure. I've, I've but but uh, yeah, he's not the the kind of guy who who would uh, go improvising on the track and then and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. Maybe he does that when he's writing it. But then you know when uh, he wants to really have every every note to the perfection uh, before he's satisfied with that. And um, yeah, then of course that sometimes creates some technically challenging stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's still challenge with with a lot of the stuff. But uh, I like I like the challenge. Well, <laughs> you have to. If you don't like a challenge, you're in the wrong band. Um, and I've seen even some of his pickup demos. Like here, I swapped out two pickups going to play the same sweep arpeggio. Yeah. Which is stuff that he's been posting, you know, recently, yeah. and they're all immaculate. Like yeah, and they all yeah. sounds amazing. For sure. Um, so it's a tough act to follow. Yeah. Um, and now there's a uh, there's a new face in the band as right. well who's. Also amazing, and that's Asim. Asim, awesome, yeah. Awesome. Asim awesome. Farah? Uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, oh, okay. And um, this was, there was an, like a, uh, a, an audition process for this? Yes. Um, uh, we made like this online um, announcement that we're looking for a mm -hmm. uh, second guitarist, and we've, we got a lot of audition uh, tapes. We had, I think we set like a couple songs that you need to do and send us a video, put it on, on YouTube, or send, send it directly to us. And, and uh, we got dozens of guys, and we got um, a handful of really good ones uh, that we were thinking about. And I think we were then actually live auditioning three or four guys um, that, uh, that we invited to the studio, and, and then just uh, kind of put them on the spot and, and told them to you know <laughs> play in front of us. Uh, you're not nerve-wracking at all. Oh, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in fact, what we did was uh, we, we kind of uh, were maybe a bit of assholes with that. We kind of invite, <laughs> in, invited the guy for like, yeah, just come to the studio, have coffee with us, and then we would put the guitar uh, uh, on their uh, hand. Uh, like, you know, which is like a, a test that I myself would fail, and you might fail also. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so uh, these are people who had maybe were suspecting that you might do that. Probably. probably, probably, because they had been already, you know, doing the, the, the video thing uh, before. And then uh, um, then from these guys, uh, in the end, we had two, two uh, Asim and, and another guy who were uh, uh, both, you know, fit for the job. Uh, but uh, then... Uh, they had to fight at the end. Uh, yeah, they they had to wrestle fight. to the exactly. death for this, that, like that, the Iron Fist. Uh, so yeah, then then you you know then you have to. Then we hung out a little bit more and see about personal chemistry and you know uh, um, what other things are going on with their life and you know uh, uh, yeah how it's gonna work with touring and all that and and we knew Asing already for for before he used to take lessons from me like ten years ago when he was moving to Finland in the first place and uh, and uh, then he was living on and off fr from Finland in Germany as well in Estonia and then uh, we've been uh, every once in a while in contact but uh, none of us really had the, the clue that he's uh, developed to be such a good player uh, so do you know if he's a Jedi or a Sith um, which kind of developed a player uh, <laughs> I think he's more of a Jedi. <laughs> I get nothing but positive vibes from him as well, and I think you've probably chosen wisely on the personal front, just yeah. having met him once. Yes. Uh, but he did give us the metal horns from at one point sure. when I he I was instructed to turn on the light on the phone and you know yeah. Be, yeah. participate with the rest of the kids. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he did that, and, and I was like, thank you. Uh, but yeah, he seems like an absolute sweetheart of a guy, and he's of sure. course a killer player. Yeah. What's interesting also technically, he's he's. Setup kind of looks similar to yours, like the way that he the way that he plays yes. lo looks kind of similar. Yeah, and does that work? I guess that works probably. Um, it makes some of these riffs like a little bit more compatible. Like you, you're writing a thing or doing a thing. Uh, for sure, yeah. um, we were looking for a player who has similar kind of uh, uh, set of skills in, in terms of technique as kind of 
Gary and me as well. A lot of downward slanting stuff works <laughs> for the, the kind of riffs that we do and uh, the kind of uh, right. edge picking stuff for the sound and, and all that. Even though he didn't like to hear that at first? Yeah, and, <laughs> and actually we talked about two-way pick slanting already there. Uh, there. There was something about some technique that I know that uh, slipped my mind, but something that we were talking about during the audition that, that he was doing differently and then we told him, like, you might have to switch this. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah, it's funny, like, this is a new age job interview. Okay, well, um, you know, uh, we were really hoping uh, for a downward pick slant, or, <laughs> you know, I, but uh, we don't want to discriminate, but, you know, against you upward types. Um, it's funny, yeah, like, and it, of course, these weird, these terms that I, I understand now are like kind of a thing, right? And I came up with them a million, a million years ago. Like, yeah. seriously, I think I actually wrote, uh, the first thing that I ever did with all this technique stuff was in college in 1992 or 91, 91, 92. And yeah. I actually wrote, that's when I came up with the term downward pixel. Yeah. Wow. And it's, I have the printout on my dot matrix printer yeah. at home. <laughs> and, and the writing tutor at school is, I have her like penmanship on this, like, no, no, you know, red pen is like, no one knew what the hell they were reading, you know, yeah. I didn't, you know. So I didn't think that these things would, you know, develop a life uh, of their own. But, yeah. but it's funny because now we've learned more about how these things work. And this idea of the slant, I think some people kind of take that the wrong way and are like, well, I don't do that. Because it's not always a visually obvious sure. that, exactly. that this is happening. Yeah. And indeed, it turns out if you're a player that uses a sort of a flatter motion, then it's not really, it isn't as visually obvious. Sure. If you're like a... Uh, you know, like a Mike Stern in jazz or something, or Andy Wood is another great player that we've yeah. interviewed. You know, they, the, the, the visible aspect of it isn't that, you know, and it turns out that the motion is, is one thing. And then the, you know, adjusting the pick so that it hits the string square on yeah. is almost a thing you can think of as a secondary thing that you do just to make sure that the pick attack is good. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, and you know, because you, you've actually had all this great experience teaching this stuff. So you, he showed up sort of fully formed being able to do these things. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. And was he playing, what, what tunes did he play during the, um, the audition process? Uh, what did we have there? I think we had, uh, at the end it was uh, actually Sons of Winter and Stars, the 14 minute song. Uh, <laughs> and the, whole, the whole thing, we gave no. like the, the, the whole uh, live guitar track that learned this yep. and then the guys had a bit of time and then they would come back and play it in front of us. Mm -hmm. That was the last thing playing wise in the audition. But uh, one that every everybody did, I think it was two or three smaller clips from from different songs. Uh, did he do any of the Winter Madness stuff that he does now? Um, that was probably not in the audition. No, I don't think so. But he so the the way that you split the parts up now, who's doing? You're doing Yari stuff, and he's doing your exactly. old stuff. Yes, I so, used to do that in between. So you have the corner office now, and yeah. he has the cubicle. <laughs> I guess. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I, I really like that that one break that you used to do that he now does. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it, there are certain aspects in that um, that solo is really a tour de force, right? It's like every technique you could kind of sure. do yeah. is in there. And there's I I like all the different you know sections of it. And that ascending triplety thing that he you know yeah. does yeah. is really cool. And that's something we actually discussed pick, pick slanting wise because that was first kind of hard for him to do because he was trying to force a downward pick slant and then I was trying to suggest kindly that maybe try a bit of this two-way pick slant and he, he first was like, oh, man, I can do it with downward pick slant. <laughs> but, but then uh, he gave up and, and, and he said that, yeah, yeah that so does he, actually make sense to do a little bit of uh, two-way pick slant. So he was aware of the general posture that he was using to, to play these lines? Yeah, I, I think he, he was uh, very, very aware of doing a lot of downward pick slanting, uh, kind of knowing that that works for his hand. And, and he's got a little bit different hand position and very different guitar position because he's got, got it much lower, that, much, yeah, much, notice that. much cooler position. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. Well, actually, okay, so that's a great segue. There's a question on here where someone actually wants to know how is it uh, that you were able to play with the guitar relatively low? Now, I didn't really think about that, but I guess a lot of people do play kind of very, you know, with, this, with the strap quite shorter. So let me find this one. So it's, uh, how can you maintain the technique you have while standing up with the guitar hanging fairly low? Did you retrain some parts or do you have a different approach? Um, some wrist positions definitely do change from, from playing sitting down to playing standing up. And... Uh, I always try to every once in a while practice standing up because if then if you just practice sitting down and then you just go play live standing right. up then it's going to be a very different feel and it's anyway going to be a different setting there's going to be many other things that are not in your comfort zone the way that you are at your practice place usually but uh, I think it's a good idea to practice every once in a while more than even just band rehearsals but you know uh, 
uh, back home as well with the strap. And something I, I want to actually do myself is uh, for a teaching setup, get one of these uh, uh, standing desks uh, where you can actually lift it up, like, uh, sometimes sit and sometimes uh, right. stand up. So, so when you're doing Skype lessons, you might actually do this at a standing desk. Exactly, that would be That's nice. very interesting. So the it, you would spend more time um, sitting down practicing though? For sure, for sure. And that's just for comfort reasons or just practical? Just cause? Um, Kind of both. Uh, um, usually just too lazy to get the strap and, <laughs> and, and stand up. But, but still, uh, then when I know that, okay, there's going to be a touring period or, or shows coming up, then I, I try to do more of standing up practice and, and figure out which parts are hard for the wrist. Some parts don't feel any harder standing up than, than sitting down. Then you don't have to worry about those, but then especially like big stretches and stuff like that, then those you have to separately practice uh, standing up. So the what you notice more is the fretting difference? Uh, yeah, for, for me it's, it's more that uh, I feel pretty much the same. Uh, uh, picking hand-wise, uh, standing uh -huh. up or, or sitting down. Now, when the thing that, you know, I have a luxury of not needing to learn a large repertoire, right? It's like I'm just working on little proof of concept, exercise-y kind of things. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I, I really feel bad for people who have to learn pieces that are long, where there's a lot of uncomfortable left-hand stuff, especially um, when, you, when you're like with a really flexed wrist mm -hmm. most of the time, because this will start to hurt after 20 minutes of playing some wide stretch thing. Like I really sure. don't like this position for yeah. the left hand yeah. Con as, a, um, as a sustained kind of thing. Like just this motion is very comfortable yeah. for me and both hands for picking yeah. motion in like a, uh, like, like a strum, gypsy strum kind right. of thing. Exactly. No problem. But having to, to keep it flexed like this for any length of time, so if the guitar's lower yeah. and I'm trying to you know, get under it like that, that's really painful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you, so when you're sitting down, you have less of that probably, right? Like what if you had to fret um, something wider from this position, yeah. that's still pretty bent there though. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had any issues with this? Not, not really. Um, and this is something I talk, talk with my students uh, quite a lot as well, how, how to do big stretches. And, and thumb position is definitely something that uh, plays a big role if a player is more accustomed to having the thumb more up here, then that, that is already limiting some of the reachability. So, right. so then if they're trying to do like a big sweep, but uh, with the thumb up, then, then that's usually not the best mm -hmm. idea. Uh, because you're kind of crabbing the neck more and you're not then uh, moving so easily. But also because the having a thumb up kind of drives your fingers in the angle rather okay. than having them straight if your thumb is well, more down. That's another good question because if you look at my calluses, they're all on the on the corner. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I pretty much and I think I do that actually because I can try to get around and make the wrist straighter. Yeah. So it's not like this. But you know, again if I it's all I don't really think about this a lot. If it's painful yeah. I don't do it. You okay, know, and yeah. I just I think I've adapted these habits over time without really thinking about it in the classic way that cracking the coat hates. <laughs> which is like because we can't figure it out. Yeah. But why do you do these things? I do them because they're comfortable. Yes. Or at some level I've no, I've just gravitated. Yeah, you that's know? of course the best guide. Just to listen what your listen to your own hands, what they feel like and, and but some something that some people don't think about is like moving the uh, the elbow. Mm -hmm. uh, because that can give you a lot of reachability as well. Sometimes, sometimes going like all the way in here to be able to do some some huge stretch like. No. Yeah, I don't want to play that chord, so that's yeah. okay with me. Like to not have that. <laughs> do you ever see Eric Johnson fret two strings with one finger? Uh, I, can you reach? I think can I, you do two? Uh, uh, two strings. Yeah, like so. In other words, you fret sort of between the two. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, and like you can this. do, and you get like a a fourth or a fifth right, right. fretting finger, and it's tricky. I don't think I can really do it. Yeah, I, I, I think it was in Ted Green's book as well. Uh, oh, yeah. Ted Green has all, all these crazy chords, and he's doing a lot of these, these kind of chords as well, where he's, he's fretting between the strings, and I, I practiced a little bit of that uh, some time ago, but uh, I didn't find much use for it in, in the stuff that I play. I would do it if I could. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I'm mandolin. Me too. Me too. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, I can see where it... Uh, where it would be helpful, like a lot of more, more colorful voicings and jazz stuff and stuff. Absolutely, like that. yeah, for sure. Uh, but you don't, to, to, regarding the standing and the sitting thing, do you don't feel particularly limited when you're standing? You still have the same vocabulary, more um, or less, or is it, or are there things you just won't go for when you're in a live situation because of the? I'd say s sitting down is still maybe a bit easier than standing up. Still, okay. there's so much more playing time done in the sitting position right. than, than standing position. But, but trying to get it at least uh, as close as possible. Um, 
then of course there's on stage the factor of of moving around more than than just standing up. Uh, we do a lot of like a lot of uh, running around the stage and can we talk know, about head banging head banging and, and <laughs> stuff like that, which uh, which makes a difference as well. Uh, sometimes with some riffs it, it feels like actually it's somehow easier if you're moving more you know with the rhythm of the music rather than just you know staying in, in right. one spot all the time. Um, There's one of the tunes I, f I forget if it's Battle Against Time or Sons of Winter and Stars, but you're doing that you know that down down up open string thing, the, the arpeggiated things, and you had to sing while doing it. I noticed yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And I forget which tune that is, but I, I don't know. Do you actually practice the singing and the playing? At the, or is um, it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you mean uh, the Battle it, Against Time? It might be. Uh, and there's the, uh, the uh, there's one of, there's a there's a very it's that technique the, the down down up thing that we were talking about yeah yeah there's some singing in one of those sections where yeah, you all on, right up, on that exact that one part yeah yeah that's crazy that's um, that was tough one to get like synchronized so so I would have to try to get the the playing part totally automatic so so then I can just listen to what I'm singing and it's a very different melody than what, right. what's happening picking wise. But do you, ha um, like, how do you slow something down like that to memorize the coordination or can you not? Do you um, just have to go for it at speed? Um, you can do you can do it slow as well. You, you can try to go with the with the beat and then you think okay where does the vocal melody come in and um, And being able to feel like where where your pick strokes are on which which beats, and then where your vocal melody is on which beats. So it's like a landmark, like this sil syllable hits on this note or something. Yeah, like that. exactly. But um, are you you're actually singing it in practice to do that, uh, or yeah. are you more thinking through it as you kind of find those anchor points? Uh, both, both. Um, then just just singing and, and doing it with the metronome, and then playing and doing it with the metronome, and then both at the same time. Right, because I think this we talk about like limb independence, right? Even in guitar playing, we talk about well, right, you know, right hand independence or pinky independence, or and especially for drummers, they talk about limb independence. Yeah. For me, I've never had any limb independence. <laughs> to me, it's just a flip book. And it's like, what am I doing on the first sixteenth note? What yeah. am I doing on the second sixteenth note? Yeah. So if there was a complex drum pattern, I'll just I'll divide it up into the lowest common denominator, yeah, right. the smallest chunk, you know. Exactly. And I'll go, okay, this limb hits with this foot, then there's nothing, yeah. then there's a ghost note, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. Exactly the same approach with, with the vocals as well. Which which uh, syllable comes on on which sixteenth note or, <laughs> right. or eighth note or whichever it is. <laughs> Yet again, so I think you're a candidate for our easy rock band when we establish this band. <laughs> cool. and, and the instant skills won't matter at all. It's all about the lyrics, and um, and we we're going for strong melodies, memorable melodies, but no technical skills required whatsoever. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do you um, do you write? Uh, so does Yari still write most of the material, or is it collaborative? Uh, he writes pretty much everything. Okay. It's, yes, it's uh, he's. Baby, to start with, the first album was um, uh, all him, and then uh, just the or original drummer guy was doing the drums. Yari was do doing the bass and the synths and, and programming and, and everything, uh, because he's got this huge vision. Uh, he he likes to uh, work out things uh, to his liking. Uh, even nowadays, he uh, when he represents songs to us, it's usually like finished pretty much really it's, you know he because even nowadays he likes to get the production uh, production figured out pretty early because he's a lot about sound and feel and, and that uh, uh, kind of helps a lot with the uh, inspiration as well so if you get good sounds then that you know kind of uh, makes you write certain stuff so, sure for so, sure so what he did, does nowadays he's got he's the, the sound palais is basically uh, ready. He, he's got his uh, drum sounds tuned in, and the guitar sounds tuned in, and bass sounds tuned in, and he's got the uh, selection of uh, virtual instruments that he knows if he wants to have certain kind of color or sound, then he uses that one, so he doesn't have to use that much time anymore to figure out how to do stuff like he had to do with the time one when he was just figuring out how to do you know orchestration by himself. Uh, so, so nowadays he, he's got when he's starting to do demos, he can pretty much just have a, you know, really good sounding starting point already, and then just record guitars and uh, program drums with a little bit of uh, uh, orchestration there, and then it sounds like a 
like the album already. Right, pretty much. Pretty much. And so do you have this uh, massive stockpile of Temu riffs that, that are like, you know, on your iPhone voice recorder or somewhere? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I do have like a lot of uh, voice memo stuff, uh, even from this tour every once in a while. If some, some melody comes in, uh, comes to mind, then I just uh, hum it on the phone. And then when I get back home and then I figure out how would this uh, be arranged on a guitar or on other instruments. And, and uh, now, since we're having a bit of break after after this North American leg, we're doing still four shows in Europe, one in the Netherlands, three in Germany, and then we're having a little bit longer break. We go away for about five months uh, with Winter Sun, and then um, we'll be back next year, May, uh, when it's gonna be then the 15th anniversary of the first album. So we'll be playing the first album back to back. Uh, the, uh, the whole, tw the doing like the Winter Sun plays the first album tour, yes. basically. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but it's not, not going to be a tour. We're going to do like selected uh, festivals and some club shows in between. Okay. And, like special special show, the f whole first album plus then like a the best stuff uh, to fill the rest of the set. Right. Uh, I mean, but the old stuff is still figures prominently in the set list even now. Uh, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, I was uh, surprised how much I knew just from the first yeah. interview. <laughs> cool. I was like, thank you for playing all those riffs because I'm <laughs> sure. like, I know them. I, yeah. I was a little bit concerned that I would just be a little bit out of place because these fans, they're hardcore. I mean, they know everything, you know, they know every word, you know, and they probably, I mean, it's, what's really cool about this, I think you said it's Yari's baby, right? Well, to me, I'm looking at this and I'm like, it almost feels like a startup that's getting bigger to the point where you have your own people and you can travel with like good gear and, and the show looks good and sounds good and you can afford to play good venues rather than like the, the junky hole in the wall where you're not going to do the music justice. Sure. And that's very, I mean, uh, even as a spectator, I kind of, you know, that's very kind of a heartwarming thing to see that, that the mom and the pop thing can, can still work. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tough business. You know, there's uh, uh, so many bands that, you know, tour all the time. And this period, especially of the year, there's, you know, pretty much every, every touring band is on the road. This, uh, it's a seasonal thing? It's a seasonal thing. Why yeah. is that? I'm not sure why it's more the fall fall when uh, bands like to tour more. Probably because you know it's the summer festival season, and then that's that's when you don't usually tour that much with the with the bus and you know do bigger tours. But then after that, that you want to tour from from uh, like late summer until the end of the year. So like this period between August and, and December, that's that's probably the busiest. But then um, again, January on until. Uh, April. That's when a lot of tours happen again. Uh, but yeah, like like uh, at this time we had uh, our fellows Amorphis from Finland as well, playing a lot of the same cities, like uh, either day before us okay. or day after us, and and then uh, actually one show we even uh, played on the on the same stage on the same day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a festival. Uh, that was a festival. The what was it called? The uh, mm, Horror, some some horror festival at uh, <laughs> a Sounds Bo good. A, a Booster, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, uh, Palladium, mm -hmm. big venue. So that was nice. There was like our tour plus their tour, uh, which is like four four other bands, and then they had some local bands there as well. So right. So, uh, so two stages though, but but still a lot of bands during the day. But went well. Uh, that was mm -hmm. really, really fun to do. And uh, so none of the secret Tamer riffs have made it into any of these uh, encores or um, live performances. Um, no, no, not really. Uh, and where, what are we doing with these riffs? Um, I'm just asking for a friend. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was uh, saying that we're going to do the break, and then during that one, um, I'm trying to now take... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be teaching a lot in Skype, but then I try to maybe do that uh, three days a week, and then take uh, other three days to work on some old music as well, which nice. I've been kind of uh, putting aside for a long time, but... Uh, now it would be nice to you know get something uh, ready done and uh, and uh, yeah awesome some some little bit more uh, personal stuff mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit different from winters on kind of my own own uh, mixture of influences maybe, maybe it's going to be instrumental maybe it's going to be with vocals I'm not sure if I want to do like everything myself all instruments or if I get some friends to play there and, right. and probably just the, Start with a couple of songs and then see where it goes. If you need any torch singing or anything easy, I'm I'm available for triangle, <laughs> um, Glockenspiel, perhaps. Not that that's actually probably pretty hard. <laughs> um, the uh, and for those who don't know, you you mentioned teaching a bunch of times. You had a full teaching day yesterday before the show, yeah. and you had 
um, people, you had students show up to Irving Plaza. Yeah. Which is, and they and they went backstage, basically took a guitar lesson yes. at Irving Plaza right. from a metal god. <laughs> people, like Eddie Van Halen, never emerged out of a poster on my wall to teach me anything. So that's pretty amazing. I mean, just the fact that you know we have a lot of people. I think it's an almost knee jerk reaction for me and probably other people of a certain age to feel like ah, oh, music, it's changed, it's different. But to me, in a lot of ways, there are things you can do now you could never have done back sure, then. Like true. there's more approachability exactly. there. You know, yeah, the rock star, that, that's sort of this unattainable god figure. That's cool, and it's sort of, um, it's inspiring, I guess, but part of me thinks like, well, I never would have had any relation to that world, just yeah. because it's just, I would, didn't know, you know? Sure. So I, I, I kind of see the, the glass half full in the sense that, you know, people like you with all these skills in the world and, and all this success are, are still approachable in this way, and you're so... Um, also, you're not guarded with the, with the knowledge. It's like completely the opposite. You know, it's a really, you're really into the teaching aspect. Uh, yes, of it. yes. Uh, I enjoy doing it. I, I like uh, uh, helping people out and when they realize that, okay, now the, the, I got it, now it works. Uh, that's a great feeling for me to, yep. to you know, be able to help people. And also uh, that makes me to uh, analyze my own playing and, and technique and stuff like that. Uh, much more deeply than I would maybe not do if, if I was not teaching and, and that uh, brings me uh, challenges and uh, uh, things that people struggle with that I might have not thought about that then I have to look into and then I might discover something that uh, yeah I could actually use this in my own playing although I didn't even try this kind of thing but but he wanted to do something like this and then you know makes sense to do it maybe this way so a lot of times I have to uh, figure things out kind of that are new to me as well you know to do right so in situation. you're being forced to think about things you wouldn't have had to consider consciously exactly. in some cases even exactly. things you are already good at right and then how to how do you communicate that to somebody who is not naturally just doing that thing right, right. right. We have a question about uh, here about um, the pick slanting after discovering the slanting aspect of picking mechanics how did you practice the one you did not already know right, right. so Similar um, kind of thing, but in your own playing. Yeah, kind of, right. Um, downward slanting, I think, always was natural for me, hand position-wise. That that keeping the hand on the strings and resting a little bit more on on this set of the strings rather than on the wrist. That was just natural for me from from the beginning, uh, and that I think drove my hand already in a bit of downward slanting naturally, which I of course didn't know about what I was doing before. The cracking the code stuff. Uh, me neither. But then, <laughs> but then, uh, then that made me realize that okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then I understood also from my playing a little bit more about why inside picking, for example, was always easier for me than outside picking. Not just because, uh, uh, yeah, I used to practice it more, but but uh, because of of how, at which time you have to do the. The slant chains and stuff okay. like that. Okay, so what, what do you mean by that? Um, so, uh, for example, this. It was always easy for me because I kind of got used to do the slant chains on the beat. And so that, that kind of ha happened pretty naturally for me. But then uh, I never practiced this way so much, like the, 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 the way that uh, Paul Gilbert did it where with the upstroke. I tried to practice that first with just downward slanting because I didn't know that you need to do two-way mm -hmm. slanting there. And, and then that was a struggle for me because of that. And, and, then, and then later realizing that, okay, you actually have to flip the pick here. Then still, it, even, if you, even if I understood the, the slanting thing, it was harder to do because the, the slant change to upward slanting was not on the beat. Uh, it's between the chunk, not on the right, first right, of okay. the chunk. So, I got you. So that, that was still harder because of that. And then when I would, what I would do, would, uh, I would turn that into, instead of playing. Instead of that, I would then do So put the uh, slant on the first beat. Think think about the lick other way around. So, you so got it's the sequence, same sequence of motions, but you're just chunking it differently. Exactly. Chunking it right. differently. Okay, got it. And that actually 
helped clarify. That helped me uh, a lot with uh, with the two-way pick slanting, uh, realizing that yeah, if you put put the pick slanting on the beat, then it's first easier to kind of get used to activating that that slant yep. in you, faster tempo. You have, I mean, yeah, th that, that's just one example of all these great insights that you had, and we talked about this last time, where you it's one thing to have these concepts, but because of the teaching, I think, and also because of your just generally, um, you know, you're, you're a thinker and you think about these things, and um, you, you've taken a lot of these things one step further and you started talking about like the interaction of the arm position, for example, where you would have students that come to you who have more of the upward pick slanting style arm mm -hmm. orientation, yeah. right? Which the sort of the forearm is a little flatter on the strings and yeah. the wrist is flatter. <laughs> and people don't realize they do this. I didn't realize I was doing things. Yeah. And I probably started out some level more like you where I had this kind of orientation and yeah. that made certain things easier, but I didn't know why, yeah. right? So th that was really cool to see that you're just kind of like you're you're going deeper into the why of these things, and then also the practical of how you communicate some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you had this thing with grip also, where the there was something with the pick grip, yeah. right? Where yeah. you kind of slide it into the middle there. Right, right, right. And and this is something because of uh, the cracking the code interview that we did. Mm -hmm. I've gotten a lot of new students to try that, which is great. Oh, really? I'm really okay. Grateful yeah. for that. Great. Uh, and and I've had to teach now much more pick slanting than before that, which is which is great. And I've yeah. gotten even more into that. And and uh, that's one thing that I've uh, looked much more deep deeper into the the grip uh, than what it was uh, last time when we were talking. Okay. Uh, and then I think I was t saying that uh, I've got the. I think I was saying 90 degree angle here right. and uh, and resting more here on the on the knuckle. I'm not sure if right, you can get yeah. this on any camera. Yeah, um, yeah um, there you go. But but then I'm not sure if I was mentioning then or if I had realized it back then that then when I do the slant change, then the That's pressure right. point of the thumb change is exactly. also not not just this way, right. which is more the edge picking mm -hmm. thing, but right. but also kind of side to side. This, uh, okay. This, yeah. This so, axis. The, I, the term that I came up with is for this, and it's, it's your, I mean, I'll give this to you because you figured this out, right? It's the fact that when the thumb kind of falls inside the index finger, yeah. that points the, that pushes exactly. the pick up, which you right. said, right? Yeah. So I call this the pressed grip, right? Yeah. right? I figure, because in a way, it's like you're just taking the top of it and pushing down on it exactly. and it sort of sticks it up. Yeah. When you go like that, now you're, you're evening it out again. Right. But it's not a perfect system where it's only controlling the pick slant. It's also controlling the edge pick at the same yeah. time. Exactly. And so these things are interact in very complicated ways. Right. You know, it just kind of blows my mind. Like these are the challenges we're up against, yeah. right? Like no other instrument. I mean, I can't say no other instrument, but I think compared to what we're given to start with versus what we have to do on our own, we have a bigger hill to climb. Because, you know, if you're a violinist, you've got 300, 400 years of institutional teaching behind sure. you saying, do this way, do not do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, but if... In rock, you know, there's some dude would be, you know, oh no, no, no I'm a, I'm an a upward bow slanter, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's a thing, you know. But in guitar, it's just like we have this mentality that everyone plays differently. Sure. You know, well, everyone could play differently, yeah. but we don't have to all play differently, and it's not a dirty word to um, to wonder about what the effects of these different ways might be. You know? Yeah. And some yeah. people have legit challenges. Yeah. They've played for decades and can't do basic things. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's all fine and great to say, oh, everybody should just find their own way. Yeah, but I was one of those not finding my own way kind of guys. Sure, <laughs> you know, sure. like it didn't, there was no way. It was like a lot of brick walls. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's definitely one of the challenges of teaching when people ask that, what is the right way to do this? And I always try to tell that maybe there, there's not always a right and wrong way to do it, but, but some, yep. something works for certain things. And I like to use Marty Friedman as an example because he's got weird looking technique, but it works perfectly for the stuff that he exactly. does. So, yeah. so it's a lot about what you want to play actually than, than uh, what you can do yeah. with the technique. It's more like, yeah, like a workshop full of tools, right? Sure. You know, like I, I would like to use this tool correctly for this thing. Yeah. And then I would like to use that same tool correctly for another thing, which might be a whole different form or something like yeah. that. So I want all the techniques as to, you know, within practical, yeah. you know, within for what's practical. But I don't want to be left in the dark with no instruction manual and cut my fingers off. Yeah. Which, you know, I have friends who have done that. <laughs> Table saws, kids, stay away from them. <laughs> They're bad. Um, okay, and there's some other technical things. I, I think especially with respect to teaching. Yeah. There's a great one. Um, are there any common playing mistakes or bad habits that you see in your students? If so, what are the best ways to overcome these issues? There are quite a few common things. Uh, mm, Technique-wise, um, for example, sweep picking, a lot of people don't realize uh, how the movement works in a slower tempo, so they can do it 
faster more naturally and then when they don't try to slow it down and gain control then they are maybe doing separate big strokes instead of rest strokes mm -hmm. and that's what I talk a lot about like getting more control on the strings by doing rest strokes slow as well which usually feels weirder than doing it fast which feels right. more more natural and you we talked about this the rest aspect of this is one of the things you work on a lot yeah. right and that you feel like is how the hands that works for you for locking up the hands. Yes, yes. Because it's it's interesting question. This is the thing I actually really want to know. Like, there's a point probably when you're going fast where it's not really clear if there are in fact rest strokes. Yeah. But in your mind, you maybe you if you learn this way, you feel that there are. Right. Right. But but there might be continuous muscle activation going all the way. Yeah. Right. But when you, as soon as you start to slow that down, though, you feel that you know the yeah. the the, the digital nature of it coming back. And that's I do true. that for sure. Like yeah. especially, it just helps me know where the hands are. Yeah, that's true. The the movement becomes more broken down, of course, when you go slow, but but the the range of motion stays the same, right? Mm -hmm. It's still, instead of going a little bit between the strings or coming a little bit out, you're still going directly right. yeah, straight yeah. to the string, which happens no matter which, which right. tempo it's you not, It's not becoming individual downstrokes exactly. again, like the Demiola style individual right. downstrokes. But like great people, uh, great players who are great at this and who never really thought too much about what happens when they slow it down might very well do it differently. Yeah. And that yeah. just makes it even more confusing <laughs> yeah. to know. And there are some techniques um, that I think are kind of just hard to do slow because there is a momentum, like, you know, if you try to get over the string with a millimeter of clearance, like when you're playing fast, yes, yeah. that's hard to do slow, because right. I'm probably going to hit it. Exactly. But the, you know, the inside picking lick that you were just playing, yeah. I feel like that's almost, you get into a rhythm with that. Yeah, you can yeah. do it, but if you made you do that super slow and just barely miss the string on the upstroke, yeah. I don't even know, you know, if you can, I don't know how the brain does that at yeah, high speed. Yeah. That's definitely another uh, one that uh, relates to that question as well, is that sometimes I get people who uh, uh, try to do too, uh, um, try to keep their picking the tiniest possible movement, and then it's very hard to do string changes with that. So then I often uh, try to introduce the idea of a little bit more free movement, and, and uh, when you're playing slow, then try to get a little bit bigger movement, and then the string changes don't feel like you have to make make a huge task to, to reach the next string, but kind of getting used to being, playing with a little bit, perhaps bigger movement, even exaggerated in slower tempo. And then once the tempo goes up, then naturally the, the range of motion goes smaller. So in other words, you're saying the, the, the distance you need to go to get from one string to another, if the motion is tiny, yeah, it might be, it may fr feel sort of more deliberate to have to get there. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. So, so, so um, just getting used to to the, the rhythmic feel of doing a string change. Uh, that, uh, for a lot of people, it helps if if from from instead of playing like this, where it's really tiniest movement on one string, yeah. just being able to do this as well, where you're actually doing a rest stroke or, or near rest stroke. Or right, on one and, and I feel like some of these movements have um, sort of a comfort zone of, of movement size, possibly. Yeah. Like where if you're doing a forearm movement with a, with a flexed wrist like this, you're naturally tracing a fairly big exactly, yeah. semicircle. But if I go like this and then I turn my arm, yeah. the, the forearm isn't turning any more or less. Yeah. But the motion is smaller because it's right in line with the bone. Yeah. Whereas if I go like this and I turn the same small amount, now I'm making a motion which is at least an inch yeah, or something like that with the that's same fine. exact yeah. turning of my arm. Yeah. So it's not all small motions are the same small motion. right? Not all large motions are the same large motion. Yeah, so it's yeah. like... This concept of economy, I think people got it all weird in their minds. Like they think, oh, well, smaller is more economical. Not exactly. I mean, I can do this really small, but, mm -hmm. you know, I can do a bounce, you know, repeated downstrokes really yeah. small. But that doesn't make it economical. It's, it's what you put into it versus what you get out. Yeah. The forearm movements are easy. I mean, you just do this, yeah. like the Eddie Van Halen tremolo thing. Right. If you ever worked on that, it's cool. I mean, it's, yeah. I get it like for a few seconds at a time when I sit around to, to practice it. And you click into this zone and it's just like... Yeah. And, and it's really neat, you know, and it feels cool to do that. Yeah. But it doesn't look economical. When you look at it, you're like, look at all this mass spinning around. But <laughs> sure. that's what this joint does. That's the way it works. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, just this kind of shaking motion feels pretty natural. Too. Yeah. And I think for a lot of, a lot of people, this is kind of what is easy to do, mm -hmm. kind of as a reflex. And then just being able to put that on a guitar, then that kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. and then, then, uh, then that way you can maybe keep the, the fast alternate picking stuff. Relax. Right. And that was, do you have that motion? Was that a thing you worked on or you always had that? Um, I was uh, thinking about it less before and then uh, certain stuff like playing long time. Of, uh, that 
to be really hard for me before. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, one song in Winter's uh, Winter Sun song, Beautiful Death, that has this one part going. Uh, I think I think it's just like that. Uh, right. When we played it years ago, then that's a song that we don't often play in the set. When we played it years ago, then uh, and it goes on for like a minute or so. So that was uh, stamina-wise a challenge always for me before, but then. Uh, then years after, uh, when we took it back to the set, then I was much more aware of, of the hand movement and, and how to how to relax my pick grip, and I think that made a big difference there. And then I uh, ha didn't have to stress about it at all, and didn't get any any tension on my on my forearm. Mm -hmm. I, I think big part was the pick grip. I was probably just creating a little bit of tension by by doing too much of this before, and, and didn't realize about it. And then later, uh, just having it. And the back of your mind that okay, don't don't press the pick too mm -hmm. much, and then then it becomes very relaxed. Well, now so that's an interesting example because I you know, I'm just looking at that now, and it doesn't look super forearm to me. If you do that again, that looks kind of more like wrist motions. Yeah, that, that's um, that's two two different things. Uh, more kind of uh, uh, traditional trash type of way would be doing uh, down up down down. That's two sixteens two eight. That feels similar. And then the other one is the the, the way that Meshuga does that rhythm. The, okay. Their song "Bleed," which is then the uh, down up down up, but okay. still two sixteenths and two eighths, like. Economical, right. more economical movement, but mm -hmm. uh, has a very different feel on it. Mm -hmm. To me, that took a while to get down, mm -hmm. where it feels like you're just having this one whip, and then the the other three notes are kind of reflex that you right. Really okay, really so that's exactly work. it. But what I'm seeing there, and I, I may be wrong, but what I'm seeing there is an initial rotation yeah. followed by wrist. Exactly, yeah. and I think that the re the reactions or the reflections there aren't so much. I mean, it, it probably I can see how you could. It feels maybe like it's just kind of doing something vibrational. Yeah. But I think that might just be some sort of wrist motion, or possibly even palm yeah. movements. I don't really know. I think so. If, if I would slow that down, do big, big movement for the first one, and therefore the right. last last right. stroke is is big movement as well. When you do the tremolo, some of the tunes have um, more specific, tr like sustained tremolo playing, and that's more yeah. of a gypsy form used for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like. So yeah. there. Um, Does that feel different to you when you do that? Um, like the, compared to the Meshuggah thing? Um, the biggest difference is that is Meshuga thing is resting more on the strings, so, mm -hmm. so you're palm muting, whereas this is all open, so I'm more um, uh, coordinating the strings by resting the fingers here, which you can kind of see that I do a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> I do that to all my guitars. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, so lightly brushing on top of the guitar, not right. trying try not to anchor too much. And is that uh, a, a, an awareness thing for you to, to touch the body that way? Um, like to know where, what string you're on? Um, or is it just that's because the fingers are there? That's kind of a natural thing for me to do. Uh, I think we talked about this last time also that uh, in the beginning I was doing more of this, mm -hmm. tugging the fingers in, and, and because it kind of looked more neat, or you know, some teachers yeah. told me that. Looks like that, pictures, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, but then I figured out that uh, even uh, the, the greatest technicians like Katrick Owen would have his fingers sometimes going like this, and mm -hmm. that was kind of for me the, the, the 
think that okay if, if he does it that way then it's okay for me who uh, Godfrey Goldman oh yeah uh, right. <laughs> so. well although he does uh, that's an interesting thing I think some players are quite variable in that respect yeah. and they might have three or four different techniques yeah, 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 right? yeah. that's what I mean that he, he does a lot of different things but also sometimes this. does that and and, yeah. and I think also sometimes uh, I like to play with my fingers still tucked in if I'm on the low string sometimes I'm more like this if I do sweep picking then it might be a little, a little bit different for the fingers mm -hmm. the, the pick grip and, and most of the forearm position and the feel is pretty much the same in, in most of the techniques to me it feels right. pretty much the same but but the fingers are still something that I'm, I'm uh, maybe not totally decided about yeah, where, right. where they are gonna go but I'm not stressing about it either I'm not worried about where they go if uh, as long as they feel fine yeah so I, I told you I, I had ordered um, we, we think a lot about like the motions and like what exactly is really happening and this is a classic example of like well is it forearm rotation and I'm sitting right here and I'm not like 100% sure yeah. <laughs> but we, we pick up these cool uh, little gadgets um, every time we see something that looks like it might be useful yep. and uh, we, we picked up a wrist sensor that's made for golfers All that right. measures wrist angles and uh, if you're up for this, I thought it would be kind of fun to, to try this out and yeah. see. It, the app is for golfing, so like unless we're swinging the guitar around, we're not yeah. going to get the full experience. <laughs> but one thing it does uh, provide is a cool real-time readout of side-to-side of -side wrist movement versus yeah. flexion and extension movement. And uh, and I think we, one question we could ask is, you know, how much side-to-side -side wrist movement is actually happening when you yeah. make some of these? Yeah, um, and that's an interesting motions. question because most of the players that I see and, and the students that I see doing that then there's usually for them a limitation with that but then mm -hmm. again I, I see uh, other players who've made it work for themselves. Well Guthrie so, is a good example of a guy who looks like a wrist player yeah. of some variety right we yeah. can't say exactly which kind yeah. but and he seems qu obviously very fluid with that and um, but I think really the hard part is that a lot of natural movements are compound movements you know there's yeah, there's a exactly. bunch of things happening right. I mean, just getting up and walking is like a thousand things happening at sure. once or opening a door, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm going to, I think I have this sensor over there plugged in. Let me grab this thing. And then uh, I'm going to steal the iPad from you. So you could right. probably put it on, on Temu and then... Uh, okay, hit the Temu button. Oh, let me do that. <laughs> One day we'll get another iPad. Yeah, um, we make it. All right, now this is really neat. Actually, I'll put it on the wide first. Where is that? Oh, I just oh I can turn that off. Oh yeah, you can do that right. Yeah, we have computer. This is the only way. So the the deal is um, this thing goes on the forearm like this, and then the sensor goes around here, and then you just tighten it up, and then you you boot up the app and it communicates through Bluetooth. Okay. And uh, and it's a kind of really amazing. So um, I'm going to give this to you, and it's pretty comfortable actually. I thought this might kind of be a little bit. So that goes on the wrist, and then this goes across the fingers. These two. Oh, all of them. The X, but not the thumb. Oh. And I think that's right. There we go. Yeah, and then I Velcro that in. And uh, that should be good. So now we just turn on the app, and there's a calibration process where it wants to know what position is, is what, which yeah. is really cool. Um, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Um, Can I move this one maybe? Oh, yeah. yeah it, you, it's, 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 the sensor just needs to be on the back of your hand, basically. Yeah. Well, let's see if it works, actually. Um, <laughs> first. We got it. Uh, okay, here we go. And, oh, and I can turn it on first. Uh, on button here. See a light there, by any chance? Like a blue light. Yeah, I do. Um, let's go into session. I think left hand start. Oh, yeah. So check this out. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So if you do, let's <laughs> there you are. I don't know. Can you get this on... Yeah, uh, yeah. On, on if you can see camera. the, it's on my, oh, it's on Tim's camera. Oh, we're on the wide? Oh, I'm, we're on me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I, there's, you got like a cool 3D model of, uh, of Tim's picking hand right here, which is pretty awesome. And we're getting, um, you get a real time readout of uh, flexion extension versus uh, ulnar and radial deviation. So mm -hmm. um, the cal, oh, we have to calibrate it first. So what they want you to do is, let me uh, do this. Um, so put it in, in the, just straight out with the fingers. And then I'll tell it when you're in there. And now extend it, yeah. And there we go. It's that easy. So now the, uh, the, uh, the 3D hand model should be a little bit more aligned. And I can turn this around. Mm -hmm. And let me see um, if you do, if you flex, for example, it should be negative. And yeah, negative 70 watts, a lot of flexion. <laughs> and then if you, uh, and, uh, if you go back to zero, we should get more or less zero. So if you straight, you're straight. 
yeah, more or less minus two or something like that. So if you do this movement, like just a straight up deviation movement, you'll see the deviation number moving, the flex extend number is really not moving, same, more yeah. or less. Yeah. So it's a little tricky to read this in real time. Uh, if you were a golfer, I think you can actually do golf swings and it'll record yeah. the and, output. And then this. Yeah, so that'll, that'll give you this number around. moving and that one's not really moving. So if you were to do the tremolo thing again, yeah. um, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you're actually a minus 100 degrees. I just don't think that's possible. Um, I wonder if... The other thing I thought of is these are... I think these are magnetic sensors, and yeah. I wonder if the, uh, the pickups screw with the sensor yeah. um, by being close to... Like, if you put it mm -hmm. near the, pick, the magnet, it may just completely go haywire. Because now I'm getting numbers that are, are... I mean, the, the, the system thinks you're, like, completely yeah. <laughs> like that. But, which but is, even here, where there's no pickups. Oh, uh, yeah, it's strange. Um, see if we, let's do the calibration thing again, see if that works. Um, <laughs> um, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, I can, maybe i got to go to... Where is that? Oh, it's here. Okay. So you're straight out. There we go. And now... There we go. All right. Do the, yeah, that looks more normal. So we're getting, even still, that's a really, are you really flexed at 100 degrees? Well, you uh, there, you might be. But now if you put it on the guitar and just do like the, the upward pick slanting sort of form where you're not super flexed. Yeah, like that. So now you're, it's, I'm getting um, the deviation number minus 50 is probably not really what's happening. <laughs> um, I wonder no, if. I try to keep it straight. Like, like super this. straight. Yeah, so. Um, I don't think that's 50 degrees though. Let me, maybe we can adjust the, um, Could it put be this, this back now? on the wide. What? Could it be this, uh, should this be? Maybe, yeah, I wonder if, if this needs to be straighter, yeah. like that, just sort of centralized. And it might feel a little strange. And then we'll do the calibration again, see if that works. Um, okay, calibration, all right, straight, uh, there we are, and then extended, okay. And you were straight when you, when you did the calibration, you yeah. did, yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, this looks a little more, and I'll get, uh, go into, um, playing position again. This looks more normal, because now I'm seeing you're flexed at about 30 degrees, yep. and you're, um, negative, uh, nine, which is ulnar. So you're a little, little bit towards the ulnar side. You should be, yeah. You yeah. should be, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. And you're flexed at about minus 25 degrees, yeah. right? So now if you do, if you did the, uh, like, sort of, uh, just repeated single note playing on that string... Yeah, and the, the wrist isn't really moving for that. You're at minus, I mean, it's not deviating, right? Yeah. And the flex, it's not flex extending either. So that's basically pure form. We're very yeah. close to it. How about if I go slower and, and bigger? Um, and now we're seeing wrist movement. Well, actually not really. This, again, it's, this is more forearm. Yeah. But do the, um, what was the first, uh, the first riff that we were doing? Yeah, I tried the, what's the sugar one? Yeah, it's really hard to mute with yeah, this, yeah, exactly mute on the muting spot, but... Um, <laughs> so that's interesting. It, here's the thing where I think like a, an app interface, which is more tuned for guitar players, might yeah. be more helpful. Because some of these movements are really tiny. Yeah. And so the... the, the the deviation number is, is moving back and forth yeah. by a few degrees consistently. Right. But is that just because, you know, of just randomness or is, or is in fact, you're just, or in fact, you're just making a very small wrist deviation yeah, yeah. picking movement? I don't know. Are you getting this data as like, uh, like, uh, you could, but only for golf swings. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because... So there is a way you, if you do, if you actually make a golf swing movement, yeah. I think it actually captures it and graphs it for you. Okay. Yeah. But there's not a continuous graph, which would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, then you could slow it down and see yes. at which point it happens. It has, they have a replay button here where you click replay and then you actually can, um, you can fast forward through the motion, okay. but only for a single golf <laughs> swing. <laughs> <laughs> so if you golf. Um, yeah. So if you golf, actually, I mean, I'd say it's pretty cool and, and thing, it just runs, right? So you can wear this while you're, um, yeah. So in here we're doing again, this, I think this calibration worked. So the deviation number is really not going much. You're in the teens, like minus, so you're ulnarized, which is what I call it, ulnarized, okay. yeah. <laughs> meaning this way. Yeah. Right, so and it, and you're pretty much maintaining that at yeah. minus fifteen yeah. degrees, and then the flex extend number, if you do that strum again, that's moving. So there's flexion yeah, extension that, happening. Yeah, there. So like that's that. really cool. 
So this is, I think a lot of strumming movements are flex extend yeah. movements. And uh, even though you, it's very hard to feel that when you do it, and you kind of have to be a mechanics nerd to even know that this is essentially happening while you're strumming. Yeah. So that was interesting. There was not much deviation there, but there was flex extend in the, in the strumming movement. Yeah. So like a more guitaristic version of this, I think would be really neat. Yeah. And yeah, you know, cool. the holy grail, of course, is to be able to get a student on this and then get, you know, they can sort of see a model of you, yeah. right? And then they're like, oh, because like some people don't really know, oh, that's how you want me to hold my hand? It's yeah. hard to describe these things. It is, and, and uh, that's something that is um, sometimes challenged through Skype. It's a little bit easier when you're you know, face to face and I can put my hand on the student's guitar. Right. And they actually see it from the point of view, how it looks like yeah. with my hand. Uh, but nowadays I have the good webcam that I can actually take for the Skype lessons and actually and show it, it from, from this angle. So it, it makes it a little bit easier that way as well. Didn't you but, used to use a foam insert of some kind, like a uh, spacer? Yeah, yeah. Did that so, work? Uh, <laughs> nowadays I haven't used it much. Just just being able to show it from, from the point of view and, and then kind of being able to feel it, uh, uh, kind of see it uh, there and then right. kind of uh, reference to your own hand and yep. then try again with my hand. Then it's easier to spot the differences that way. And then usually you... Um, so it's di different thing for different people that makes you kind of that that makes it click. Right. Like uh, meaning in terms of what, how you uh, display it to them. Yeah, me meaning in terms of how you can get it to then feel natural that you're not trying to do this kind of movement mm -hmm. or or, right. or or then this kind of movement. Right. But if we're looking for a, a downward slant, then yep. and uh, so just for stroke, then then how to make that kind of feel natural and more for arm rotation. Right. So for reference, everybody, it's minus twenty five degrees <laughs> <laughs> flexion <laughs> and, and uh, single digits. So in other words, uh, you you're fairly flexed here, minus or well, moderately flexed, and uh, your wrist is more or less straight. It's a few degrees into ulnar. Yeah. So that and like minus five, minus ten, something yeah, like that. That's so that's something. basically it's sort of a comfortable. Like almost like you're hugging an invisible cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably. And, and how about this movement though? If I go oh, like the bell down, against the sun, yeah. so then we get you'll more, get flexing and extension. This, right? right. So what's going on there? I mean, I, I'm like I feel like Rain Man watching these numbers fly by. Yeah. But what's happening <laughs> is you're going from about minus twenty five flexion to zero. Okay. Yeah. So, for reference, the upstrokes are flexing to about here, but they're not flexing, or then they're extending to about here, but they're not yeah. extending higher than right, that. Right, right. Right. So you're not going up like that. Yeah. You're right. coming from from negative to zero. Yeah. So dun 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 right. dun dun dun. Yeah, dun, that makes dun, sense dun, because dun. this doesn't feel so natural. It, you don't feel that, right? right? Exactly. And when you extend quite a bit, you'll feel that up here. Yeah, exactly. And that's more of you know, if you're an upward pick slanting person, you might feel this extension yeah. bend all the time. Right. It's very cool. I mean, I think this is kind of the future of teaching in a way, this kind of thing, because you know, the, you'll never outmode the teacher, but the teacher needs good tools, right? And the teacher's got to be able to say, hey, listen, do this. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to feel like this is the, you know, match up against the numbers. You know, the other thing is like when you're, you can give someone a starting position, but it moves, you know, yeah, if they're yeah. not like, um, you know, comfortable or they haven't learned a thing. They're kind of wiggling around, and, and they need to know like when it's right and when it's not right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like if you could, if it vibrates or something, you know, it's like, oh, oh, that was it. Like just right. that's the, especially fast playing. You know, when it just got has to click and has to be smooth. You exactly. Know? Yeah, and, and sometimes it is like that that the, uh, that you immediately feel the student feels like okay now now something clicked, and then you kind of wanna uh, look a little bit back that okay what was it what was that thing that made it click, and sometimes it's talking about certain angle, thinking about certain angle, thinking about certain muscle group or, or thinking about how you're holding, holding the pick. It can be it, a right. number of things. Whatever is the trigger, right. that may, it doesn't even have to be right. It just has to work. Right? Yeah. They have to think about this, you know, whatever it is that gets their hand in the position yeah. to do it. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I think that you're, the, you have this dual citizenship between, you know, like touring musician and, and like, you know, teacher. And, and that's it's like such a great, um, it, it's really the ideal uh, background for somebody who wants to teach this stuff. Um, and I think all these people, I couldn't be going to a better, going to a better person. Um, do, you, uh, do you want to take us out with uh, some awesome playing and I will hold up a 3D model of your hand while you do it? Sure. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll take it off. Do, do what no, 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 I'm kidding. We don't really have any way of capturing the data, so, uh, yeah. but I think this is just kind of a, the idea is really, a cool. really cool, you know, potential thing for down the road, something for like sure. this for guitar players.
And uh, just so for anybody who's interested, it's called uh, the Hack Motion Golf Sensor. Um, no relation. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I have no endorsement arrangement with these dudes at all. I just like we see these things. We've got a stack of. of um, we have a stack of these devices on the desk. Okay, you know, yeah. like we have a we have an armband that measures actual EMG muscle activity. Uh -huh. We've got the leap motion sensor, which is a uh, video game controller for mm -hmm. hands. And it's you know we're getting there. Like ten years from now, it could be a whole different ballgame. Yeah, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. Um, do you guys uh, want to do some more improv uh, on yeah, the way out? I'll, I'll okay, cool. Lesson. Yeah, you can do. Um, you want me to get out of the way? I'll get out of the oh, way. Oh, no worries. <laughs> you want to chat? No, I, I don't want to get out. I want to get out of the way. <laughs> you want to slide over? Slide over. Sure. Cool. I think we should use some uh, exciting lighting. Thank <laughs> you. 